record. Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together to take on various topics that tend to cross one's path when one embarks on this journey of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and a teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I design and make and teach things related to interactive stuff, user experience, and I also coach. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Jersey. It's been it's been a weird couple of weeks because we did that crossover episode with the uh, Tell the Damn Story guys uh, mm. last week, but we recorded it on a different day. And while we did meet up and and, and chat about things, we were in like a, a room with other people. So it's it feels good to be back to classic lean into art. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, both styles are really fun. It um, we we do sort of we catch up with one another during this a, a bit and, and uh, you know, especially sandwich before and after, but yeah, that's a whole different production style with, uh, with guests, especially two at the same time. It was a ton of fun um, to have uh, Chris Ryan, Chris Ryan and Alex Simmons uh, on our show and to be on their show. Uh, I highly awesome. recommend checking that out. It's uh, what tell the damn story.com or it's tell the damn story at uh, dot. Um, oh, what's that anchor? Right. Yeah, it's it's at anchor.fm. Uh and I yeah. think it's it, it if you just do a search on anchor for tell the damn story, you'll find it. Um Yeah. So, but it was linked in the show notes for the past episode too. So, it was a two-parter and that was a fun experiment to run as well. Like how do we do like an episode with a cliffhanger to lead into another one? Um, that was clever. I didn't know how they were, they were going to pull it off, but then suddenly <laughs> uh Chris Ryan found that found a cliff and he's like, look, let's jump. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, then, uh, then we continued. So yeah, the first part of that two part series starts on, on their show and uh, we continue it on the lean into our cast. And uh, the other thing that is newsworthy is tomorrow. I mean, this episode is being recorded on October 31st, 2019, which means tomorrow is November 1st, which means what it is mm. art sound off time. Um, we did a little bit of talking about what we were planning on doing for Art Sound Off a couple episodes ago, uh, but we've refreshed the website with new prompts, right? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, Art Sound Off is now on its sixth year. And if you know, you sort of look at the world, there's there are different creative challenges, as we call them. I don't know what everyone else, what's the general term for this? I, I've landed on the creative challenges, but that could be just our jargon. But the idea is, uh, there are events that are art themed that say make stuff and there's there for all sorts of different disciplines and stuff. And you see this, uh, I don't know, I, I notice it on my radar and over time they've become more and more like Instagrammable and having a nice concise uh, list of, well, here are those prompts. Here's the sort of mini tasks or challenges within the overall challenge. And I thought, well, yeah, that's pretty cool. Like what if we, what if we did that? And so Jersey and I, we, um, put our heads together and came up with sort of a, a friendly mix of, of prompts that might be, um, they're a bit more open, more easier to interpret and branch off. But some of them are, I think, are going to be easier and some of them will be more difficult as well. And sort of not just clumped together where it's all the difficult ones in the first few days, right? We spread it out and, um, and should create some fun dialogue amongst everyone participating as well. Uh, hopefully as a side effect. Yeah, and it's a month of art journaling. If you haven't heard of this before, and the rules are simple, rules, the suggestions are simple. One, record an art journal of some of some kind. And two, share or post it if you wish. You don't even have to post it if you don't want to. You can just use it as an opportunity to practice. And then three, explore what others are sharing. Now, that exploration part is important because if this whole idea is to like level up and practice this, this thing of uh, art journaling, seeing how other people are approaching it will be informative. Um, and that's, that's the benefit of sharing is like you are uh, implicitly helping others along by sharing your own journey too. So, but you don't have to, right? So it's artsoundoff.com has the prompts and uh, uh, the you know, suggestions for how to participate. And then if you want to follow along, it's the Art Sound Off 
hashtag on social media. We're going to be posting to Instagram and Twitter um, with prompts and with our entries. Um, did you decide what you're doing yet? Almost. <laughs> um, because I've had a lot of ideas and I really, I really like the side effects of, of uh, experiments, right, in, in past years. Mm -hmm. And I just, so I feel like having a series of experiments and it's probably, yeah, we'll see. I mean, maybe we'll talk about that more later in the episode, depending on okay. which questions we cover in this, in the second half. All right. Well then is that a prompt to say, let's get to the episode. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So every once in a while we do an episode called reading, watching, playing R W W P. And the whole idea is, is that um, I think other artists talk about this too, is like, like feeding the creative you know, um, creature, but also reminding ourselves that we're human beings, that we should relax every once in a while, that we are not defined by the work that we create, that we are complex and nuanced and, and, uh, we are creatures that, that can carry multiple truths about ourselves. And we are very hardworking and we think really hard. So you will too. But then also we like to relax and remind ourselves to, uh, disengage from the intensity of trying to become as strong as possible together. <laughs> <laughs> and also at the it same time, if you habitually are trying to become strong as possible together and you know, that, that whole Dragon Ball Z like dynamic as a lifestyle, um, <laughs> that might be such a habit where as you are enjoying what you enjoy, you end up discovering stuff along the way because you have the whole thing going on that uh, Jersey describes as the analytic eye and you go, Whoa, wait a minute, what's this? Why did I react this way? And all of a sudden you are doing some kind of uh, development of who knows your own thoughts on a, on a particular thing. And, and there we go. The music means that we're changing gears and diving into the topic proper. And one, two, three. Oh, wait, it keeps going for a little while. <laughs> I was waiting for them nope. to kick it. <laughs> oh. Yeah. They really build the anticipation. All right. Yep. Uh, so, <laughs> reading, watching, playing. What are we reading, watching, and playing? Who wants to go first? How about you, Rob? Do you want to go first? Oh, you're funny. You. Uh, that's fine. I pull that on you a lot. So, um, okay. <laughs> I have been. Uh, I'm going to just dabble, jump around. I think um, some of the, some of the things I've been um, making the most time as far as recharging, and um, just where I'm wandering toward in, in entertainment has been both watching and playing mostly. Mm, okay. So um, I'll just jump into playing. I recently I played a demo for a switch game called Yoshi's crafted world. Okay. And let's see, there's a other, there's a game for the Wii U called, what was it? Uh, Yoshi's. It was a uh, yarn. Uh, what was it called? And, um, Yoshi's Woolly World. Okay. So what's interesting is like I saw Crafted World come out and I sort of thought, ah, I'll get to that at some point, um, especially when it's with sort of a greatest hits discount kind of thing because it's totally a remake of, of uh, Yoshi's Woolly World, which I have for the Wii U and I think I talked about on the show a few years back. Um, and that game is is great. It's a it, which is a it's a fun platformer, really mild, uh, you know, challenges and puzzle solving. It's almost, it's the most amazing mild game I've ever played because it's it's engaging and relaxing at the same time. Almost too much so to play before bed because I've fallen asleep playing Yoshi's Woolly Woolly World a lot. <laughs> and. <laughs> Because it's like part of, it's, you know, it's like play a little game before bedtime kind of thing. And, uh, but what's funny is Yoshi's uh, Crafted uh, World is just a different game. And mm. it feels a lot more like, um, what was Yoshi, the first Yoshi game on the Super NES? Oh, Yoshi's Island? One? Yoshi's Island. It reminds me a lot of Yoshi's Island, but, but you know, some... Uh, evolution and refinements. And so you're, you're doing a lot of the, the chucking of the eggs and solving puzzles with that dynamic. And, and then you're, you're chucking eggs, not just in two, two dimensions. Like you're, you're sort of a, you're not just sort of a, uh, a trebuchet, uh, trebuchet or, or a slingshot uh, mm -hmm. in one direction. You actually can turn toward the camera or away, even though the primary gameplay is two dimensional platforming. Mm. 
And it adds, it adds a ton where you're now like, you're looking around at all sorts of things like, oh, I could chuck an egg at that. Oh, I could chuck an egg. At, and you're just looking for, and I, anyway, I love the demo and I, I'm planning on picking it up, but I haven't picked it up yet. Uh, oh, and it was fantastic to, to play uh, as two players as well. Oh, great. So it's, it it's, looks, it, it looks so good. It looks really cute. It's super cute and enough of a, uh, uh, and I guess enough things to interact with and explore where it is not intense. It's not like, Oh, but like, there's something about it is where I think the music isn't quite as sleepy <laughs> where it's not like, la la la, this is so comfortable. Lullabies. You're in a woolly world. Oh, wool is so warm. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Yoshi's look so comfortable. And then just fall asleep. <laughs> it's not that extreme relaxing. Okay. But, uh, but it's still mellow and fun. I haven't played that many Yoshi's games, or Yoshi games. I've played Yoshi's Island, and I've, um, mm, what other ones have I played? Yoshi's Island's the one when he's got Mario on his back, right? Like Baby mm -hmm. Mario. Keeps losing Mario, Baby Mario, yep. And then, there, oh, Yoshi's Cookie is another one I've played. Um, and mm -hmm. I gotta say, like, as Nintendo games go, like, like that, those rank pretty high for me, like, compared to mm -hmm. any other, like, I like the Mario games fine, Zelda games fine, uh, but Yoshi is, like, just the right amount of adventure and super, super like, when you, like, are about to fall into a pit, you can do that little, like, jump in midair where he, like, makes his feet waggle and he does this, <laughs> as he, as he goes up there, <laughs> stuff like that, it's just, like, too darn cute to, uh, it is, it, it actually kind of puts me more on edge because I don't want anything bad to happen to him. <laughs> Oh, sure. Oh, cuteness <laughs> backlash. <laughs> Too cute to handle. But, uh, so, huh. okay, so okay. Yoshi's Craft World. I, you're you making haven't tried a, uh, thing, the, uh, the games coming later with Yoshi, it sounds like. No, no, it's pretty early stuff. Um, I've got Yoshi's Island for um, our 3DS, so that's what I played on Ooh. mostly. Um, uh, really good. I'm, I, I bet you would dig this one. It's it looks like I would. I was watching the video while you were talking about it, and yeah, it looks it looks really really cute. Um, okay, oh, ready to talk about something less yeah. cute? <laughs> oh yeah, let's go there. What's happening? Okay. Um, so I have been really enjoying this podcast called the Tear Them Apart Podcast, which is uh, cartoonist Evan Dorkin and one of his friends, his lifelong friends, who like loves monster movies and horror movies, and it's them just talking about horror movies. And especially today, given that it's October 31st, there's like a nice eight episode archive to dig into. The latest episode, I really liked it, um, was them just talking about experiences with um, movie trailers that played on TV that frightened them as children. <laughs> <laughs> because it was a very similar experience. Like they were describing ex an experience that was very familiar to me, at least. I don't know if, if you did this, Rob, but um, when I was a kid, I we had a little black and white TV in our bedroom, and I would stay up all sorts of hours watching UHF television um, because it would be like, oh, Laverne and Shirley's on. Now it's, uh, you know, what's happening? And now after that, it's uh, Sanford and Son, and all these old sitcoms would play. Um well into the night like until like four o'clock in the morning but like at in the late hours they would play trailers for upcoming scary movies and uh like dawn of the dead and things like that and so like there it, it the whole episode is them just talking about that experience of like different trailers from different time periods and like how it freaked them out because they were in their bedroom alone in the middle of the night they're not supposed to be up right <laughs> and now this 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 <laughs> this image comes on the screen that like almost assaults them because it's so upsetting right um <laughs> So that was a fun one. Um, but they also did like a two-parter, uh, like a John Carpenter retrospective where they just talked about John Carpenter's films going from like current day all the way back to his first films. Um, and they, the, the neat thing, the framework they go through it is they, they, they talk about their experience watching it for the first time as a young person and how they experienced it then versus what their relationship is with that film now. Um, so if, if you're a, a fan of monster movies or scary movies um, and, you know, Evan Dorkin is the creator of Milk and Cheese comics. He's a, a, a very, very funny person. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's worth listening. Huh. Tear them apart. It's the tear them apart podcast dot home dot blog. That's where you can find it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> now here we go. And yeah, he always does like uh, art for the episodes. Um, so you get like cool Evan Do Dorkin art with each new episode. Evan and Paul. Wow, that's pretty great. So, so 
Hmm. Hmm. That is fun. So they, and they do this um, like seasonal style. So it's, is it like a weekly update until a season's done or is it sort of like, here's a season, everybody. No, they're doing it like weekly until a season's done kind of thing. So, and I think they, they, they've been roughly weekly. um, But Hmm. How interesting. That's um yeah, all right. I will add that to my podcatcher. I um well I, I think I might have shared this one before because but I just really, really like this show. It's I think it's very re-listenable, especially if you're someone trying to absorb like it it's not your main discipline, right? And so it's uh the Hackaday podcast, which they talk a lot about uh hardware and electrical engineering type things. Mm. And then branching off into other aspects of uh, crafting and building. So anything from 3D printing to soldering to um, even uh, programming. And it's just this variety of topics all around people building physical stuff. And they run through sort of uh, highlights of, of different articles and things shared through their community and things that they've, they've seen. So it's in a way, it's like a summary news show, but it's pretty educational, especially for me because it's not sort of my main background. I've been dabbling and learning still. And uh, it's, uh, it's it, it just, they share a lot of weird and interesting things. Like um, when, a, like a story about someone who hacked together, what was it? A, um, I think it was a radio to automatically update their clock. They needed to boost the signal because it wasn't, because, you know, you can have a clock radio that had, like there's the, um, I forget, it's like an, an, an AM radio signal that will synchronize a lot of clocks. And, mm. and it's, uh, I think it might be a different signal depending on where you are in the world. But uh, you, you've seen clocks on the wall that aren't connected to anything except power that will update themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And they, they communicate through this kind of signal, but that signal has to reach them if, in order for this update to happen. So someone did, you know, uh, 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 added um, essentially a signal booster to repeat that, that signal into their house. And I, I think I, I, might, I might be conflating stories, right? So that's neat in and of itself. But then there was a story of someone who did similar, a similar hack, but then caused, what did they cause? It was either Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to stop working for their whole neighborhood. <laughs> so it's not like an interference signal with everybody's Bluetooth. Wow. Yeah. So they had this. It was. It wasn't intentional, but they say they hacked together a thing that had this side effect. But then it's now it's another story of not just that kind of thing happening, and how do you fix it? But who, how do you even know? Because oh, I remember it was the remotes for people's cars. Their car, their cars wouldn't unlock, or remote start, and stuff like that. Right. Wow. So. Uh, they were, uh, there was someone who was into ham radio and so like ham radio folks are, are a certain breed of, of, um, uh, electrical engineer that, you know, is they're really into troubleshooting and also teaching and sharing their discipline. Typically that's kind of a, a thing for their community that they're really into and someone helped track it down. They tracked down this anyway. So, uh, and then the, when they tracked down this person, it wasn't about like all oh, retribution or punishment. It was about education saying, hi, you uh, caused this. Here's how this can happen. And, and let's get that fixed. So, and they cover, hmm. that's just one sample of a kind of story you'll run into on that show. That's neat. The Hackaday yeah, well, podcast. That's at hackaday.com, I think. Is that right? Uh, I think, yeah, I think so. Hackaday.com. Slash podcast. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, fun maker type show. Cool. Uh, and if if you're into it, then I'm guessing the spirit is probably very harmonious with our spirit of like joyfully celebrating this kind of thing. Oh, yeah, very much so. I mean, it's yeah. definitely a, a welcome to all skill levels type show, even though the, the hosts are, you know, advanced practitioners and at different, you know, different skills, different levels, but they're inherently like they wear a lot of hats to try to, you know, design and build things to solve problems. And they do that just as a lifestyle, both professionally and for fun. So they're mm. constantly talking about the things that, that they're building too. Oh, neat. All right. Well, what do we want to get from me? What am I, am I watch or I've got some reading. I've got some playing. I haven't been watching that much lately. Uh, it's been kind of a, a wild month, but, um, but I have, I have made time to read 
and then also to play a little bit and also a little bit of listening. What, what, what would you like to hear about, Rob? You got the notes. Oh, how about um, reading? Because I'm looking for more things to read. I need to do more reading. Okay. So, um, well, this is a book that Anne uh, actually brought to my attention. Anne, Anne is a huge Ray Bradbury fan. Uh, and I've read Fahrenheit 451, but that's pretty much it. And I've read some of Ray Bradbury's uh, comics made out of his stories, like Come Into the Cellar, short stories. Um <laughs> But I've never read one of his classics, which is um, The Martian Chronicles. Uh, I don't know if you've read this, Rob. I haven't. Um, so it's it's sort of... Okay, I'm, I'm only about a third of the way in, but um, it's sort of an anthology of stories that are all interconnected in... It's, the, it's literally chronicles about people on Mars. And um, there's one story where there's... Uh, a husband and wife and they have this kind of tumultuous relationship and then the woman is getting this these visions of this strange man who has get this black hair nobody has black hair that's impossible oh it gets weirder he has blue eyes blue eyes what how can he have blue eyes he must be from someplace <laughs> else right and she's like oh and his skin so is other world or outer world right right yeah yeah and and so uh but she keeps having this vision and he keeps coming to her in dreams and talking to her and like she learns this song through these visions that she's having these dreams she's having about this weird man and then she learns that he's from this other planet called earth and he's going to take her away and so then like the the twist at the end so it's got like these little twilight zone kind of stories but the twist at the end is mm -hmm. that the husband plays a trick on her to get her to stay home when she's going to go out to this place where he he surmised from her visions that she's going to go meet this 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 human and then he goes out he's like I'm going hunting and he leaves right and then like you know what happens he comes home and he's like no I didn't get anything she's like but I heard a shot and he's like yeah but I didn't get anything kind of thing um and then she's heartbroken because she knows that this thing but it's, then it switches to another group of people on Mars and like the kinds of things that they're dealing with and there's this really interesting thought experiment in one of the stories where so the Martians are telepathic they can communicate through telepathy mm -hmm. And there's a short story in there that are, again, all interconnected with this larger narrative where um, what would happen if you were delusional and could see things that weren't there? Like if you were like hallucinating and absolutely delusional, but you communicate with your mind, right? So in other words, you would be transmitting your perception of reality to other people. Your hallucination would become, could potentially become viral, right? And so now it becomes this big question of like, well, if that's the case, then what's real and what's not real? And how do you how do you manage that? And so it, it literally goes to a insane asylum on Mars where it shows explorers like how would you manage insanity of that nature um, if everybody can communicate with their minds? So uh, and, it, and it's Bradbury. So he has just like a lovely way of describing scenes and how things feel and and describing he shows but doesn't tell the way he describes things. He'll describe how a character's frustrated to make you say, oh, they're really frustrated. He doesn't say just mm. that they're frustrated. He is, he's very poetic and, and lyrical, and and uh, it, his language is a pleasure to experience, if that makes sense. Um, it's not just about what happens in the story. It's about the way he describes it so that it conjures the image in your head in this very kind of... Um, uh, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of like when you're a child, like a really lazy summer night, like a summer night where it felt like it could just keep going on and on and on forever. And you're drinking it in as a kid, right? I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but I had a couple, you know, a handful of summer nights like that, where it just felt like the, the day was packed so full, but it felt like there was so much more. And I felt like I was really in the moment and experiencing it. his, his prose feels like that to me. It, it puts mm -hmm. me in that mindset. So, um, yeah, I'm, re I'm really, I'm enjoying it a lot so far. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just making me realize that there's so many more of his books that I got to read. But yeah, Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. Hmm. That's so fascinating. I, I love hearing the, like the elements of a voice of a writer. Um, I love being affected by that. It's, uh, yeah. that's, that's cool. I, I need to check that out for sure. Add that to my reading list. And um, like something on my reading list that is, that I find um, the writing style and how the story is portioned very interesting mm -hmm. is uh the second book in the wild robot series so i mentioned a few episodes back that i was um enjoying the audiobook of um the wild robot well there's a sequel called wild robot escapes 
and I'm not going to say anything about the plot. It's um, the, the gist of it. You have a robot that you met in the first book that has some, some amount of awareness gained from essentially being, you know, crashed on a desert Island kind of thing and growing wild and finding harmony and being a, you know, a, becoming its own sort of creature right and then is in a new situation in in this book and um how the story is explored like there's a awesome cliffhanger things pick off pick up in the in 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 this book and is just this another fascinating setup which uh, which reminds me again of the kind of intensity that you can explore in the raw uh like uh like big the the bigness of of like a fast and furious and the sort of the raucous intensity but then you have like the um you know keen sue finds a way to channel that into making march grand prix and like he talked about his method for that and i feel like that's going on in the wild robot and i find that a just a beautiful execution of circumstance that could be described with um like let's say a, a different a different movie rating than is being shared in the book even though mm. it's not it, it's like totally um very much a um a young reader's appropriate um experience but like the kind of things they're tackling are just um like being sort of in, in a way like being being imprisoned in a and and stuck doing doing a job somewhere that you have no idea how to escape. In fact, there's a lot going on that's preventing you from being able to escape. Right. Mm. And how in the world does this, you know, happen And you could think of very direct and obvious solutions, but because of the nature of the character, there's not going to be a direct and obvious you know, thing that's done here. Fascinating, like subject matter, the rendering of the subject matter in such a broad approachable way where it's still very intense but it's totally all ages, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome, right? So it makes yeah. me think of it's like strips away like the extra stuff, the 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 qualities that I enjoy, right? I mean, I like the bombacity of of you know stories where people are swearing and driving fast and making stuff blow up and not everyone lives and all that stuff. I, you know, that's fine, but uh -huh. I don't know somehow the same emotional weight can be carried in other storytelling techniques. And that's what this book demonstrates. Quite mm. well. The wild robot escapes by Peter Brown. One more wild piece robot. of it mm -hmm. is uh, the chunking of the story is clever, right? Where there's a lot of um, chapters, a lot of chapters, like more chapters than I'm, than, than I'm, um, I don't know, like, I guess some writers do really get quite a high chapter count, like Stephen King or what have you. But uh, this is uh, different for a kid's book. And it's sort of, there's all these vignettes and it's okay to move things in between where there's, there's an experience and then the chapter ends and then time passes that doesn't have to get covered. And mm. so I, I'm just, it's almost like there's a series of, of the in medias res experiences where you're you show up in the middle of things and then when there's there's not as much middle or it's okay that other events don't have to be visited firsthand right so this is a technique that i want to uh embrace as well in in mm -hmm. storytelling where um just go to the scenes that matter and that that's another thing done super well in this book oh interesting yeah that 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 sounds awesome um like so it's not it's not like linear in the sense of you're literally following every minute of their lives up until the end of this particular story right mhm mm exactly yeah, the and, and it's funny the leaps it's almost like every chapter has a job also because the leap can be short in between chapters or longer and mm -hmm. it's almost like that story beats done next chapter right and even mm -hmm. though it's sort of a but I think it's partially a, um, a, it's almost like the advantage that you have when you, when you like when I was making a web comic frequently and you have the situation of it's an update, it's a page and you need to give the page a title where you're, it's just like a piece of a story. Right. Mm -hmm. And normally you would bundle the whole thing as a, as a, 
you know, multiple pages and give the, that group of pages a title, but now you're giving every page a title. So yeah. it's, you, get, you get this meta extra performance of the story advantage by saying, oh, another chapter break. Here's a mm-hmm. new name. Now what you thinking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. There's something about that, about that like presentation style that, that changes the way we engage with the thing. So, oh, cool. Mm-hmm. So the wild robot escapes. Okay. Uh, are we at break time or do you want to do one more? Uh, let's see. How are you feeling? How, how, let's see. Well, how many have we each done? We each did one. Huh? Oh no! I did. I did the Martian Chronicles. No, we did two. We did two we did each. Two. Okay. There we go. That's balance. That's balance for you. Okay. So, uh, how about we take a break and then we'll come back and we'll ask some reading, watching, playing, and or questions. Um, we'll talk a little bit about like some of the ideas behind why we do this reading, watching, playing topic, and mm-hmm. sort of check in on how like the last couple of weeks have been treating us. Uh, and we will do exactly that. But first, we got to thank some people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It is a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you say, hey, I believe in Jersey and uh, believe in Jersey and Rob, and I believe in the stuff they make, I want to help make it more sustainable. But how do I do it? Well, you can con- contribute as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash lean into art. And you can cancel it any time. So you could do like a one month donation if you wanted to and just go check out all the extra stuff that you get in the Patreon. And I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on a regular basis. It means a lot to us. First up, Tim F. Thank you, Tim, for believing in what we do. And Catherine Sugru. You can find Catherine on Twitter at Kat, K-A-T, Sue, S-O-O, Gru, G-R-O-O, like Gru the Wanderer. Thank you, Catherine. And Shawnee Redfern. You can find Shawnee on Twitter at Shawnee Redfern, S-H-A-U-N-I, Redfern. We'll link to these in the show notes, too, by the way. And Stephen Black. Thank you, Stephen, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Stephen on Twitter at Black Sideshow. And finally, Carrie Goble Billick, also known as Mushin Girl, everywhere you can find Carrie on Twitter, on Instagram, etc., as Mushin Girl. And you could join them at patreon.com slash lean into art, where you will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread. We could talk about whatever you want in a safe space with fellow leaners. That's patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. It really does. Right, what a I wonderful get... signal to get. Yeah, really. Um, you know, dollar a month. Uh, that's like 12 bucks a year. And then it's like you stepping up to help make the show, you know, make uh, help make it sustainable so that, you know, we're not uh, taking time away from other paying projects to do this, right? This can replace other paying projects. That would be pretty awesome. So, mm-hmm. and what's happening? Oh, no. <laughs> Second half of the show. <laughs> Okay, there's the signal. We are now in the second half. So, uh, what do you want to talk about? What what what, what questions do we want to take on for checking in? Uh, let's see. All right. So, reading, watching, playing. So we have uh, sometimes reading, watching, playing. It's just you know we can cover tons of things. We talk about just just keep keep on sharing and whatnot. But a lot of times we have the show. It's like well we're we're talking about what we're dealing with firsthand, and then we talk more about. Uh, what are we learning about it and, and what are we discovering and, and how is it working and stuff like that. And, um, you know, on one hand, it's kind of like, well, reading, watching, playing, you did a great job summarizing that right in the intro, right? There's, there's a lot about it where, um, you know, so if you're, you're someone with your creative pursuits, you've got side projects, you got main gigs, all are wrapped around your, your some form of, um, you know, designer, storyteller, visual creator, or what have you, but you're, you're, you're working on the thing. And that's one of the reasons why you're here. This is fits in. It's harmonious. Like hearing people think about that stuff too. Awesome. And then the reading what you're playing kind of has like, well, of course you're feeding this process. Great. You got to take breaks and what have you. But I do think there's tension there where, where, um, you know, there's, there's times of, of, I don't know, like deadlines that that somehow creep in in a way that compete with one another and you as a resource and your time and attention and i'm wondering you know things like it's i don't think it's always that obvious because i can go months without sometimes 
reading as much as I want, right? Or like, oh gosh, I was going to finish some show or movie or whatever. Totally haven't gotten to it kind of thing. And, and I know I'm not alone in that, right? There's, so what, what do you do um, in, in I don't know, what do you do with that as far as uh, reading, watching, playing in the times where it seems uh, less easy or that, that list is building and, and you're like, I know I'm going to enjoy this and I want to whatever, reward myself or study this or whatever. Yeah. But it's just, it's, 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 I'm not getting to it. Yeah. It's, um, you're reminding me of, and I know you, you weren't, you weren't pointing in this direction, but it's like, it's reminding me of a personal experience I had when I was interviewing for a graphic design job. This would be like 20 years ago almost. Um, and it was, it was at, I won't name the place, but it was a place where they make magazines and put on shows about classic cars. So it was, it was like, like that's something where I had like a lot of passion on the subject. I was just looking for a job doing graphic design and like the, the, the graphic designer who was leaving the company, like sat me down and totally did like a speed sort of scenario where it's like, okay, ad executive comes in, they got something they need by five o'clock. President of the company has comes in, has something they need by five o'clock. Three people from sales come in, they need something by five o'clock. What do you do, dude? I'm like, Okay, well, I look at each individual piece and I evaluate how long each one will take and then I'll prioritize them according to the amount of time that they'll take and I'll inform the people who are at the lower end of the chain. And so I, right, I'm like, like, yeah, I know, I've done this before. And then, anyway, I didn't get the job. I guess I didn't answer the question, right? Because I didn't have the intensity they were looking for of, like, Keanu. But, um, <laughs> but it, it does become, like, it's like this idea of, like, we're spitting all sorts of plates all the time and sometimes we can feel like, uh, I don't, I got to keep this plate going. I don't have time to attend to you know, being human being, or we don't even notice that we're not attending to being human being. Right. That That's tough. And, and I tend to resent my relaxation materials if I'm trying to squeeze them in. Right. Like, it's like, <clears throat> Oh, like it becomes this urgency. Oh, I'm not going to listen to a little bit more of that audio book because otherwise I'm never going to finish this book and I'm going to talk about it in Lena's art. So I guess I have to do it, you know, and now I'm not, now I'm not being present for it and enjoying it. Right. Um, so, one of my answers to that is like audiobooks are great and uh so i have a hoopla account with my library hoopla is that digital borrowing service it's like overdrive and there's another one called libby libby's the app mm -hmm. that works with overdrive um and so i borrow like four different books at once and i slowly chip through each individual one because like part of the way i manage it is, is like well let's say i've got I'm going to clean the kitchen. It's going to take me 20 minutes to a half hour to clean the kitchen, right? I can listen to a book while I do that. I can double double it up and like, do, like hopefully it'll relax me. But if it's like, oh, I've got like this really intense series of essays on the nature of evil, that one's going to require a lot of my attention. And that's something where I really should be just sitting down and listening to it. Let's not do that. Oh, here we go. I've got the Chronicles of Narnia. I can put that on for a little bit, you know, and I'm, I'm, relaxing i'm getting into that headspace of enjoying language and fantasy while i'm doing another task or like in my case you know i'm doing a lot of driving lately because i'm doing a lot of workshops and events all around ohio and then in in michigan so i'm spending a lot of time in the car lately well audiobooks are great for that um one of the ones that i didn't get to mention in the first half is um the roy rogers show so i've been like loading up a bunch of old-timey radio shows um which is <laughs> it's storytelling, right? And it's just like, it's like a uh, theater of the mind, sort of like cowboy Western stories. Uh, and the Ray Rogers show is great because it's like, he's got like a story. And like, of course there's the commercials for post serials, but like um, it's, there's, there's always an adventure story. And then there's a song where he and Dale Evans sing together. And then it closes with like a little, like sort of a like message for from him to the kids listening. Like, Hey, be careful when crossing the street. <laughs> So it's like it's That's got a the whole familiar <laughs> formula in some ways. <laughs> yeah, it really is. You can see how it would be very appealing to me. Um, but but anyway, so it's like I'll have multiple things in process or progress so that I, I I can really let my mood dictate what I consume at that point, if that makes sense. Because I don't I don't want reading a book to ever be uh, a chore. I don't want it to be something where it's like, well, I have to finish this. It's like, okay, well, maybe I'm not in the mood to listen to something that's super intense right now. Maybe I want something that's a little more relaxing. Maybe when I'm driving, I'm going to be driving the car for three hours. I want my brain to get lost in something else. Yes, I'm watching the road. I'm paying attention to driving, but I want to not be bored. 
So let's attend to something that's like a little bit more challenging. Um, so, but then I guess finally, and you could respond to any of these that you want to, Rob, but like as I would round up my points by saying is that there's also an element of really forcing myself to, you know what, if the plate's going to fall today, it's going to fall. I have to check out and be human being and I need an hour to an hour and a half to just disconnect from everything because I'm not going to do a good job tomorrow if I show up exhausted and mentally spent, right? I'm going to do a better job if I really protect a couple hours of relaxation in there. What do you call that circumstance? The sort of... What do you mean? Relax or else. Yeah. Or <laughs> what, what would, no, you know? No, so my, my friend Jesse Jesse Kaufman, you know him. You're, you're friends with him too. Uh, he has like this really gentle way of engaging with that, and and I love it. It's like I call it like the gentle eject button, uh, <laughs> where he just he's just like he'll if somebody's like really giving him a lot of stack, he'll be like okay, you can have that, and then it's just, it's like it's like this cheerful like okay, I'm dusting my hands, and I feel like I, I engage with my work the same way. It's like ah, ah, I'm I'm freaked out about work. Okay, you can have that. You can you work. You can you can have this like little cloud of insanity, and I'm gonna hit the eject button. I'm gonna go be a person for a little while, and you know what? I'm going to not feel guilty about that. Um, it's not always easy. I'm not always great at it. Like there are times when Ann and I have been like up. Oh, we got to go to the zoo. We got to go look at animals for a little while because this is just like, this is too hairy what's going on right now. And then I'll be there and I'll still be sort of in my own head and not in the moment. Um, but for the most part, it's like, I, I feel like that, that gentle language of like, okay, you can have that. Here you go. Here you go. Crazy work. You can have that. I'm going to go over here now and I'm going to go do this thing. And it's not that I don't care. Right. I think that's for me, at least part of the way I've always engaged with it is like, well, I have to be this intense. Otherwise I, I'm not showing my dedication. Well, you know, you can also be super dedicated and say that like, yeah, I'm so dedicated that I'm going to make sure that I recharge so I can come back to this thing and be at a hundred percent. Hmm. I find there's a, uh, like you mentioned the word recharge and yeah. I, I, I think i I'm going to pick that as a way as a way in to re respond to your exploration, okay? Because uh, I heard a lot of awesome themes that that uh, I feel a lot of common ground with. But then, like you think of the word recharge, and there's an implication of depletion, and there's an implication of being able to be filled, and all sorts of stuff, where some of the metaphor doesn't hold up in my experience, even though I've used that metaphor to help drive, oh, let me make a plan to allow myself um, like a buffer to relax and recharge or a, um, where I think, I think there might be just different kinds of depletion that don't always match a different, a method of recharge. <laughs> and yeah. I, it, so not to overcomplicate it, but I, I, I get stuck with that sometimes where I think, all right, of the things that I'm looking to do, um, there isn't, it's almost like what the question of what is work comes to mind. What is, um, what is something that I'm trading that I feel some sense of um, needing to um, like put something back into my system of, of experiences and lifestyle? And then there's obvious things like, like waking up at some point you need to go to sleep, <laughs> um, having, um, the, um, a body that can move. Well, you need to move it enough so it stays movable and healthy, right? Um, you need to eat. So like some of these things are pretty straightforward. So eating, you, you know, have energy and nutrients, calories, all that kind of stuff. But then, then it gets, it gets weirder and more puzzling as, as soon as you say work. Right, because if you're working on stuff that that's like, well, yeah, I identify as this. This is my a big chunk of my life, and I love it. And I have multiple things that I that I'm working on that I love. So sometimes recharging is just doing a different project, yeah. where the creative process can dictate to me. It's not a recharge, as in I don't know what it is, like a depletion of. Uh, synapses in my brain willing to fire anymore about something. We're yeah. just like, come on, brain, put something together. 
So I can put something out of my hand. I'm either typing or drawing or, or coding or whatever. And brain just blows a raspberry at me. And, but then something is calling to me. And if I wander toward that, and I've, I've mentioned this, like being like, and then I'm, I'm going to putter for a while or purposefully putter or what have you. Anyway, so that whole recharging thing isn't, it's not as much as like the, the metaphor of like, oh, I'm a depleted battery and I go do something that fills battery. I get puzzled with that sometimes. Yeah, it's it's not yeah, it's not a perfect metaphor because I, I I totally identify with what you're saying. I have this experience and and we've talked about this about chunking projects. And one of the reasons I enjoy chunking out making a comic, chunking is in like, okay, there's a part where you're doing thumbnailing, there's a part where you're doing penciling, there's a part where you're doing inking, coloring, lettering, etc. Part where you're doing outlining, part where you're doing pagination and book design. Uh, so there's a lot of different kinds of mental um, disciplines required to make something like a graphic novel. And one of the things that I enjoy about that is that sometimes there are days where like thumbnailing, it's just, I know I can do it, but my brain is saying like, I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna do it. I can't think about this anymore. I'm like, okay, well let's pencil for a while. And while I'm penciling, it's not that I'm recharging anything. It's just, I'm sort of letting my subconscious do its thing. That problem didn't go away. That problem's on my mind. Whenever you have like a stress dream or even just a weird dream, right? Like there's evidence that your, your mind is, is crunching on these problems. So sometimes like switching gears is a way to refresh myself. Maybe recharge is a bad word or not. It's just an incomplete image. It's refreshing yourself by attending to something that's a part of the work that is at this particular moment more amenable to your mental state and like, no, and trusting. Like this, this is for me, this is the hard part is I have to trust that my brain's doing something else too. It's working on this as well. And when I come back to it refreshed, perhaps I'll be able to attend to it a little bit more thoughtfully and more directly. I think there's that, that really, that's a good way to describe um, becoming more familiar with your own work style and finding the, like, you know, having like putting your, putting yourself in a situation where you're going to be effective and, if you have, uh, I don't know, a problem with with um, some tools or something in your environment, hopefully there's a way that you can reshape or adjust that or put yourself in a situation. So it's almost like what situation do I put myself in in order to feel um, ready to, to make stuff? And part of that awareness is to know that I need to not always make stuff. I'm not like an infinite... Um, machine to keep uh, cranking out creative output. And I know that the narrative of that is more complex than just being depleted or ready or it's, it, where it's almost like, am I ready or not? And what am I most suited for right now? And then sometimes it's this also, Hey, wait a minute. If I notice my overall arc of recent experience, I have, I have, I, um, have I put myself in situations where I'm not making um, creative output? So go read, yeah. go do something else. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's like a little uh, composition, a way to sort of orchestrate your own day-to-day -day experience to make sure that you are going to be ready enough when you have to, or, or, or want to take on something where you're, you need to make, put some output wherever that is. And what's funny is that can vary based on where a, a project is in the creative process. Like do, am I, am I researching, synthesizing, generating, um, does, uh, pr problem solving through, through design or am I testing an idea? Am I expanding it and building on it? Cause I'm confident in the direction, I'll, whatever the, I have my own, um, sort of, language about developing stuff, putting anything into the world, whatever. And each stage of that is a thing I could be ready for or not. Yeah. Per project. The, there, you're reminding me of, there's this idea in Zen Buddhism that like one of the, the chief sins in Zen Buddhism is to be inadvertent, is to do things not on purpose. Mm. And like, it, it, so in other words, what's the opposite of that, doing things purposefully, right? And I, I, this reminds me of some language that Kate used on your guys' podcast, uh, Art and Science Punks, is purposeful pauses, right? Mm. Um, 
and being like really, really aware. Like this, this is where the whole idea of mindfulness comes. Like this is the definition of mindfulness is being like really in the moment and aware of everything that's happening around you and being aware of like what you need as a person. Like there's, there's historically, and I think we're, I think the period we're in right now, at least in the West culturally is I think we're in this, like, I've, I'm hopeful that we're in a transition where we're starting to like throw off some of the 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 burden of this this narrative of the heroic crunch the the burn to finish a thing right like we've got like what what Gene Kranz called go fever which led to the Apollo one catastrophe where three astronauts were incinerated mm. right like this idea of like we just gotta get this thing done and we just power through you know we've talked about this a lot um, but like ju- you could look at the kind of intentionality that Zen Buddhism calls for is like the same level of intensity, but it's just, but like it's all mental. We're saying like, okay, my body's telling me that it really needs a break. It, my, my mind is telling me that it really needs to disengage from this thing right now and do another thing for a little bit, right? And then being that aware of, of the way you work and what you need in the moment is that to me is just as intense as that guy going like, we gotta finish this thing. Let's all let's we're gonna burn the midnight oil. And get a pot of coffee going, right? Um, ju- and and like I would say more heroic <laughs> because it's pretty hard to be that aware of everything that's happening around you all the time. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I suppose you're reacting to I think something that I've been I was implying, and I mm-hmm. don't know. If that's the full implication, because part of it too is um, it's finding, I mean, it's executive function. It's executive function to based on like, what have you committed to and what are you getting done and what is working and not working and being willing to tune into it. And also in a not severe way, because yeah. it's, it's okay to be you know, where you, you might be in an urgent situation and you probably should behave urgent to overcome whatever's in your situation. That's a, mm-hmm. probably a good idea. If yeah. you know the deadline is five, it's three o'clock, it's whatever. There's some problems to solve and things to make, and hopefully you've got what you need to to get it done. And um, and you need to navigate that with your full attention, full attention. Yeah. But then not everything fills that. Is if it is is hopefully not everything you're working on a day to day basis is that level of urgency. And mm-hmm. then there's this other. Then you end up in the situation of well. I like this. When should I chill? When should I not? Whatever is, is chill recharging? What? I don't know. Or is doing more recharging? I don't know. <laughs> right. Uh, because the, yeah, for me, yes, it depends. Um, yeah. and is that a kind of mindfulness? I think so. It's a dialogue with my own experience and I know that I don't always, I don't always know. And, and, uh, but I'm, I'm willing to, to explore it. And uh, try well, one thing, I guess, in all this is that I try to just be willing to make the call of step back and and um, try not to repeat something that's not working. Mm. And you know, whatever that is, panicking, panicking about a deadline, or panicking about relaxing, where it's like, oh no, I've had these comics on my shelf for how long? Like I was going to mention, I kill giants. And uh, I enjoyed the story. Turns out it was it was a pretty intense story. And um, which I don't know the title, kind of. You could joyfully destroy giants, I guess. Depends. Anyway, but um, <laughs> but yeah, because I had this. I w- I bought this a long time ago when when it was on the shelf and uh, in in because uh, now it's bundled as a trade paperback or whatever. And and this was on, when it was in floppy form. You know, and that that was an example of of one of mm, let's say a lot, maybe dozens and dozens of comics that are on my shelf that I haven't gotten around to reading. And so then I'd be like, uh, you know, is this self-imposed urgent of of um I just want to get unstuck. And that's fine too. Hey, this is evidence I'm stuck. How I'm choosing to observe it. I want to get unstuck. And one of the things I do for that is I challenge myself. Surprise. Um, and, and so I'm like, I'm going to read this thing soon and, and I'm, and I'm going to start soon and I'm going to complete it sometime soon. So anyway, um, I don't know if that, that, I think it was kind of in line, but like it also, there's this little bit, I, I basically added a confused addendum to your, mm. 
sure. uh, mindfulness. No, in, in the mindfulness thing that I was talking about, like I don't want anybody to walk away with the uh, assumption that I'm suggesting that I am awesome at this because like part of part, part, like sort of the fun and not fun of making art for me is like getting lost in it like really lost in it like losing all sense of like that i'm a person and like really being absorbed in the activity itself what we've talked about before like some people call flow state or whatever um and like also my alarm will go off it's time to go pick up my wife from work or go meet her someplace or go meet somebody else and i'll still be in that headspace i'll be up in my own head and it, it looks when I'm like that people it looks like I'm upset it looks like I'm really really upset about something like like angry or frustrated about something and it's not at all it's like it's just I'm still coming back down to like like engaging with human beings again and Anne will be in the car with me she's like you okay what's going on you know like nothing I just uh, and I'll be like blinking like that like uh, uh, it's just so like when I'm in that headspace, I am not aware of what I need in any given moment. Like it's it on the one hand, it's really awesome because it's fun to get lost in that little time warp and and also to feel like that level of connection with what my hands are doing on the page kind of thing. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's like yeah, I don't know what's going on around me. I can't pin it down and be like a really uh, super efficient observer of myself, right? So. Well, but that's what reflections for. So you can you can say like, oh, look what happened. Um, no. Why did that happen exactly that way? And how does that fit and whatnot? And people are in in a variety of disciplines experience what you're describing. Like, I, yeah. I, and I I don't mean just you know generic paint with a broad brush uh, flow state. I think there's something about um, deep deep uh, th deeply engaging activities where you're you you are are putting something into the world like coding can you can you load you can load so much as far as what's happening in the system and what happened before what's happening next what's happening now how does it and and then there's something about that where you're doing that much comp composing and constructing and whatnot yeah i don't I, lots of disciplines like writers uh coders uh illustrators you know, storytellers of all stripes i mean it, um, yeah musicians yeah yeah Dancers. It's pretty engaging. Like Ath why? athletes. Yeah. Yeah. So then you can get lost. And that I yeah, for, I for the most part, I, I I love that. But then there's a lot of times where you do where you I you do experience the like a non-organic stoppage, right? Where yeah, it's like yeah. <laughs> it's not like, oh, and then my ship of magical creative effort and execution. <laughs> pulled ashore and then the, <laughs> the and the steps rolled down and i calmly walked out and looked around and said ah what's next no it hit a gd iceberg you're like what what's going on <laughs> wait i was busy <laughs> there wasn't water here <laughs> yeah yeah i i i really should be i should be better at capturing when that happens like when i get into that magical place so i can like chronicle that a little bit and find out like really how often does it happen if i were to guess it's it's only happened you know where i really get disappear into it maybe a dozen times in the last 10 years you know most of the time the work is just the work right it's huh. like just get the stuff done um but it, it only for me it only tends to happen when i'm working on really really complex illustrations which i've as i've been doing more and more simple work lately I don't get to get to there. And because I working in smaller bits of time, it's like, okay, you got two hours, you know? Whereas when I was starting out, I would have like seven hours, you know? Like I've got seven hours slated to do this drawing and it's gonna take seven hours to do this drawing, right? So there's a lot more opportunity for that to happen. This um, is a huge dialogue in uh, communities of, of people who code, right? Oh, really? This is a huge, oh, huge. Because of productivity and, and real deep problem solving and and other like methods being brought in to deal with it right this is where um the there isn't a lot there's a lot of uh conversation not a lot of agreement except in pockets as far as you know what how can you be an effective coder some people solve it with well you got to be working in pairs and that way you're mm -hmm. never um never going to get stuck because sometimes flow looks like staring at a staring it looks mm -hmm. just like you're so engaged you're not moving in the physical world but you're you're you are lightning across mm -hmm. the 
hemisphere. Right. You're on the astral in your plane. Head. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, that doesn't look productive. Right. <laughs> but it can be, right? So that's where like yeah. Eureka's can happen or whatever. And the unevenness and the the inherent, like you can argue about being industrial and, and industrious and consistently productive. And then how do you get there repeatedly? And there's a lot of disagreement with that. And then coders encounter that friction a lot because of, mm. you know, I don't know, tradition, style, personality, at least from my era. I don't know if that's still as much of a thing, but. I remember when I worked at a newspaper ages ago, the management like judged whether or not you were doing a good job by whether or not you were typing. And I was like, real, really? You know, it's like that. That's what you're gonna measure us is like. And so, like, I, I still to this day have a very loud typing style. Like, I, I punch the keys really hard because I learned, like, when I was learning how to type properly, you know, like actual like home row. It was at this job, and like, the louder you type, the the more you would be left alone. Right? Like, oh well, he's clearly doing something. You know? Yeah, I'm typing up an auction ad, but then after this, I got to do something for like you know the 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 editorial section, like an editorial illustration, and I'm just going to be doing mouse clicking. It's not going to sound as what are you doing over there, right? Mm. I was working on Gosh, something. I wish I knew you at the time. I would have coded up a a, a clacky script. <laughs> Could have got you a bonus. <laughs> he sounds like ten people typing. <laughs> Sometimes it sounds musical. What's going on? <laughs> oh. Going places, uh. Droz. Right. <laughs> That's right. You're gonna be a star. All right. Are we at a uh, good opportunity? A good chance to break again and then wrap it up with final thought. Yeah. 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 Could okay. be final thought about maybe um, come circle back to art sound off. And yeah. Yeah, let's do that. All right. Okay, so uh, in a couple of minutes, we're going to thank some other people who make the, or we're, we're going to conclude the final thought. But before that, we got to thank some other people who make the show possible. And those people happen to be us. We make the show possible. And the thing that I make or am making that I hope you will check out, and it ties into Art Sound Off, is, and I announced it today. I dropped a Thunder Punch Daily today. Um, episode 263, I'm announcing what I'm doing for Art Sound Off this year. And what I decided, what I finally decided to do, is I'm going to do 30, uh, 30 essays about 30 different characters from the Transformers franchise, from uh, going all the way back to Gen 1, all the way up to like Transformers Prime and a little bit of Robots in Disguise. And it, this is all to lead up to, and I'm, and I'm not posting them in the Thunder Punch Daily thread. Uh, or feed. Uh, I moved them to the new feed for this new podcast that I'm starting uh, later on this year called Four Million Years Later. If you're not familiar with the Transformers mythology, the whole premise was they crash landed on Earth four million years ago, woke up in 1984, and then became, you know, cars and tape decks and and airplanes and things. But uh, the, the so I'm going to do 30 essays about uh, 30 different Transformers, and then at the conclusion of that, it'll start with uh, a weekly show where me and an old friend of mine watch an episode of the Gen 1 Transformers series every week and then record an hour of us talking, like basically expanding on these essays about the characters, about the, the, the set design, the uh, the storytelling, the story construction, and our experiences w with them as young people and as adults today and why this 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 this, this uh, intellectual property continues to fascinate us Uh even you know 40 years later so rob you make a thing whoops yeah um that's i'm, I'm excited about that project jersey um i am already subscribed so oh did you <laughs> highly, <laughs> that's yeah, awesome. highly recommend that get that uh it's i i know for sure if you just put the url what uh uh, how much, what's the URL? Four million. Oh, four million years later dot com. Thank you for yep. for making me say that. Yeah, yes, four million years later dot com will take you to the web page where you can you know okay. subscribe to the show. Four million years later dot com. I put that in my uh, podcatcher, which is Overcast, and it found the RSS feed. No problem. That's awesome. Yep. All right. Okay. So yeah, I, I make something too. Um, I suppose. Let's see. Let's talk about. Um, hmm. Let's talk about coaching. Why not? All right. So uh, in recent months, I've been putting together this business to provide a service. That's something that, that I've done incidentally for many years in, uh, in a role as far as just being a, a team member or, or a lead designer or, or just you know, recognized as someone who's, who's done this stuff a lot and people coming to me for um, thinking through stuff 
conversations, right? Some would call it advice. I wouldn't call it advice because and that's never been my style. And uh, honestly, you might do this already with people that you work with. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's called coaching. And uh, you can solve all kinds of problems like events related to, uh, to your career, the, you know, choosing this, this job or that job, or where, do you, where are you going next in your current role or um, collaborating puzzles related to like, how do we, how can we, you know, work together to, to bring this project to its best completion to serve our audience, all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, I'm a coach for uh, individuals and teams to think through those kind of problems. And that's, that's the, the, the coaching process looks like having a, a, you know, you're sharing a lot, deep conversation. I'm listening deeply and I ask you questions to help move you through, move you along. And it's, it's, it's like adding like this outboard brain to your brain to help um, not have to just do your normal day to day because chances are there's something that's working, but there's something else that might not be working. And that not working elusive stuff is what sort of causes things to get stuck and not resolved or decisions that happen incidentally instead of on purpose. And so that's, uh, that's what I'm here to help with. And so you can, uh, you can try it out too. Like I, maybe I'm the coach for you, maybe not, but you can try a free discovery session, which is real coaching. And uh, it's uh, easy to sign up. Go to robcoach.me.com. Uh, nope. Go to robcoach.me. <laughs> I like saying .com. Uh, <laughs> anyway. If, I, so if I, I can offer a testimonial, we did an oh. episode a couple episodes ago where you did a coaching session with me about the Baron Von Baer uh, 31 day pitch challenge. And I was in a space headspace where I felt like, okay, this project is starting to feel a little bit big. I'm feeling some anxiety build up about it. I'm like nine days in and I'm feeling a little bit, I wouldn't say discouraged, but I was feeling the weight of what I, I was asking myself to do fall upon my shoulders. And it was starting to feel, it was starting to turn from joyous challenge to a little bit like work. And then we did that coaching session where you asked me leading questions and pushed, you know, were gently nudging me in different directions. And suddenly I realized, you know what, I need to do some more research to make this thing that make me feel like I'm equipped to deal with it. And so I went to the library, checked out a whole bunch of books about like Aztec, Mayan and Indian art. And uh, it reconnected me with the joyous part of the exploration. And it, it made me realize that it, it helped me find a blind spot that I didn't know I had, right? And it reminds me of something Dan Mishkin once told me when he was like looking at a story of mine. He was like, oh yeah, it's your problem is right here, here, and here. And, and like, he just like pushed him. And it was like almost like a fulcrum point where everything just clicked and all started to work again. I was like, Dan, how did you see that? And he's like, well, you were in the weeds. Like you're trying not to drown, right? So like, of course you didn't see that, but sometimes you need an outside observer to give you a gentle push and then suddenly it all clicks again. So that's to say, robcoach.me worked for Jersey. <laughs> Thanks. That's really cool. Thank you for that. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, very brave for, to to do that coaching session live. And uh, thank you for thank you for that. No, I was it was just, I benefited a lot from that. So that's awesome. I can't recommend it enough. Robcoach.me. Okay, so uh, the other thing that we make that we hope you will engage with is the Lean Into Art Discord server. Yes, we have a forum. We have a safe place for you to hang out and talk with fellow leaners. Uh, there are three public channels. There's topic requests where you can ask us like about like different things you want us to talk about on the show. Comments where you can comment on past episodes. Challenges quests where you can post like different things like in creative challenge season, like Art Sound Off, for instance. And then uh, there's three channels for our Patreon supporters where you can post works in progress and get some feedback on it. You can get a high five by sharing something that you thought was really cool. And then there's just a social channel where I was sharing news uh, about my personal life recently, some big changes that happened to me, uh, only with people who, uh, you know, leaners who support us on Patreon. So uh, the Discord invitation link will be in the show notes for this episode. And I guess you could just go on Discord and just search for Lena to Art, right? I think so. I think we should be publicly findable. But if not, it'll be in the show notes. Yeah, at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash leanintoart. Okay, so final thought time. Okay, all right. So Art Sound Off, you shared, you have a, honestly a really cool approach of you, you know, you're, you're hacking the challenge to, um, because hacking the challenge, it's like, well, there's, there's all these prompts, you know, why not reply to them? Well, we've done this many years in a row. <laughs> so uh, replying to prompts is, uh, it's fun, it's interesting, it's useful, but then uh, we're doing that as a common, well, to try to help the community and encourage uh, new folks to, to jump in because 
Uh, this is an opportunity to do other projects also to say like, all right, I'm going to practice doing my microcast for other purposes besides journaling, right? Maybe mm-hmm. including a different kind of journaling than are listed in the prompts. And that's cool too. So I've got a sort of, um, I've got this backlog and um, like a list of topics that I want to cover on the Polytechnicast that I just haven't gotten around to. And Art Sound Off is a great um, reason to just say, all right, 30 things, pick 30 things, make it and, and uh, put that out there. Because, and so I have sort of um, a grouping of things that, that I might do something similar to last year where I had sort of, I wanted it to unpack some video game development experience and share that. I wanted to talk about um, this idea that user experience is really for anybody. So to, to, if you can pick up the tools of user experience design to the, any depth and provide some kind of benefit with where you're at. And I encourage that. The, I encourage the non-exclusivity and the uh, you know, thoughtful adoption for, for anybody for things like uh, you know, thoughtful uh, meeting gatherings and well, considering what artifacts you're going to create to help drive a decision. What kind of decisions are you looking to make and what kind of all that stuff that's involved in, in user experience that affects all sorts of disciplines. Anyway, got a big backlog of that stuff still too. Uh, some journaling replying to um, you know some prompts actually that came from the slow down podcast stuff like that mm. um, so yeah some kind of combination of journaling UX for all season two and then maybe maybe interviews but those are harder because um, so those so I probably would have maybe 25 and five like little groupings of posts that add up okay. to 30 okay that's my hunch. I'm still actually figuring it out this last day of October, one day to go. So, <laughs> just in time. Well, that's part of the fun of this kind of challenge too, is, is like seeing how well the plan survives and, and, and adapting. Well, this is something you've talked about before is practicing adaptability and adapting to the plan once you've engaged with it. Right. Um, yeah, as for me, it's just that this year I didn't want to push myself really hard because I because I did an intense challenge for October with a 31-day pitch challenge where I, I literally created a pitch from not scratch, but pretty close to scratch in 31 days, an hour a day. Um, and it's like, okay, well, what can I do that would just be fun? What's a subject that I think is is something I can engage with in a playful way? Practice reflection because I'm going to be talking about this thing that I've thought about for 35 or more years. Uh, but I'm going to think about like, well, how did I engage with it as a child? How do I engage with it as an adult? How's my, you know, like one of the prompts I have on my list is the character Starscream, who when I was a kid, like I genuinely, look, genuinely looked up to him because he was like the one Decepticon who disagreed with the boss. All the other guys fell in the line and they were like despicably loyal. Like for instance, like Shockwave, Megatron says in the first episode, all right, I'm going to Earth, Shockwave, you keep this house in order. And Shockwave's like, fear not, Megatron, Cybertron shall remain as you leave it. Megatron's gone four million years, right? Four million years. And Shockwave's like, nope, don't change the paint. <laughs> you know, it's like everything stays as Megatron <laughs> wants it because he's coming back. You know, it's like, that's how loyal he is, right? And so you're surrounded by all these people who love this guy that much. And you're the guy who's going to say like, nope, I think you're an idiot. I think I should run things. I'm like, to an 11 year old, I'm like, that's self confidence, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, he's a coward and he's a, he's a prick and he's a liar and a cheat. But like the fact that he stood up to everybody in the room that way, like as a kid, I was like, wow, how do I do that? You know? So thinking about that, but then also thinking about now as an adult looking at the character, I'm like, oh, he's a sniveling little weasel who's just like got self grandizement syndrome and clearly doesn't have the skill to, to like, his, his reach exceeds his grasp, right? And mm. what fun those kind of characters are to write for this reason, because we're setting them up to fail from the start by by virtue of their worldview. And are they going to learn from that? Or are they not? Like that kind of essaying, I think, will be really fun to do. And it, it's tapping into a topic that's really easy for me to grab onto because I've thought about it for a long time. So um, mm. so it's still practicing journaling, but just with a theme to it that also happens to coincide with a project that I've been meaning to do for a long time. So. I like the elegance too. One theme for the whole month because yeah. I easily have enough prompts where I could do the UX theme the entire month. And that I, I find your choice inspiring. And hmm. I, I'm, we'll see by the end of the day. 
Okay. <laughs> I'm also I alternating. do tend to pick something, and okay, even if it fails or or I flounder or change, I'm picking something. I just haven't yet. So one of the ways I'm trying to keep it also unpredictable for myself is I have a tendency to like Autobots more than Decepticons. Like there's a couple of Decepticons I really like, but like for the most part, I find them kind of on the dull side. Like Soundwave, everybody thinks Soundwave's so cool. It's like, yeah, he's got, he, he talks weird and he loves Megatron, but there really isn't a lot to him, you know? I mean, like if they expanded more on like the cassettes thing, like he's got a cassette that turns into a cat and like there's one episode where he pets the cat and like, oh, do more with that. Do Show that he actually loves his cassettes, you know? That would be interesting, but they never do anything with it. Whereas like the Autobots, there's like more to them, I think personally. So like I was like, but let's alternate every day. I'd either like I go Autobot Decepticon, Autobot Decepticon in order to challenge. So I'm creating a little bit of challenge in that. It's like, OK, I'm doing a day where I talk about the Insecticons. It's not much to them that as far as I can tell, it's like except that it's neat that they're the first characters in the series who when they use their scanners to find an alternate form, they found organic creatures and not cars. You know, OK, that's interesting, you know, but what else is there? I don't know. We'll find out when I get there. So. But anyway, so there's a little bit of element of random chance that I've introduced to keep it hmm. flavorful. That is clever, too. I'm writing this down. <laughs> <laughs> Purposely put in some blind spots for yourself. So, all right. Well, I'm excited to take on another art sound off with you, Rob, and see what the leaners have in store. Um and I want to encourage anybody who's playing along, yes, share them on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Rob suggested an interesting idea of even possibly using Instagram stories as a way to do your art sound, which I think is fascinating, right? That's, that's like mm -hmm. utterly ephemeral. It just goes away. Unless you make, uh, a, what is that, like a spotlight or a featured story collection, that then that persists. But oh. So you could. Um Totally. I mean, you can, uh, I did a, a bit of research and gathering of a bunch of new options at artsoundoff.com. There are sort of like more traditional, like podcast-ish feeling solutions. And then there's things that are, that are like more streaming and, and, and um, but still uh, stored, right? Uh, like YouTube, for instance. But then mm. you have, uh, yeah, I mean, things like stories. Different platforms have have story mechanisms and video sharing too. So, um, wherever, let's uh, let's see what experiments we all we all do. I might yeah. dabble in that just for the heck of it. But then um, I'm trying to, I don't know. Like I, I'm I've I struggle with my with my locking it in because I do like the just you know pick a thing, stick with it, even though I'm happy to show up and experiment all over the place but i don't i don't know i i my service mindedness uh argues with me in that way Being yeah like, hey, same here because it would be fun to do like sort of like an art sound off edition of mist where it's like you put the trail of of of, of threaded thought across multiple platforms and you have to follow along to put together the whole story um <laughs> sure yeah across different media why not yeah but but yeah I'm not confident that I have the ability to create a, a, a narrative so compelling that it would want, make people want to follow along across all those different platforms. But who knows? Maybe I just need to try it. Um, but yeah. Okay. Well, uh, artsoundoff.com is where you can find all of the prompts and in, information on how to participate. And, you know, what's the Polytechnicast's uh, address? Do you have that handy? Yeah. Interactive-storyteller.com slash Polytechnicast. And mine will be at 4millionyearslater.com and on various social platforms. Okay. Thanks, Rob. I think we did another podcast. Um, I think we did. Thank you, Jersey. We're almost, almost at 300, if you can believe it. Yeah, that almost was a question this time, too. But that's for another time. <laughs> okay. What shall we do for 300? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, we can take that conversation into the Discord. Mm -hmm. Um all right. Well, we record the show. We stream it live on Thursdays at noon Eastern time, 11 a.m. Central. And then we collect it as a podcast at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash leanintoart. We'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger, also of leanintoart.com. And I'm Rob Stenzinger, places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart 
And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.